In this video, we're going to be talking about basic atomic structure. So we know that the first ancient theory of the atom came from the Greek philosopher Democritus. So he told us that everything was either empty space or a tomo. So he essentially thought if you cut something in half enough times, you would get to a particle that was so small that you couldn't cut it in half anymore. And that is what he called in a tomo. Now, he was ignored for two thousand years because everyone believed Aristotle and Plato instead. They believed their theory that everything was made up of earth, fire, air, and water, or some combination of those things. It wasn't until 2,000 years later that John Dalton came along and came up with the first testable hypothesis for the existence of atoms. So, Democritus was the first ancient theory of the atom. John Dalton was the first modern atomic theory. So his model was what we call a billiard ball model. Essentially, the atom was seen as a hard sphere. So he told us that everything is made up of atoms. Atoms of the same element are identical. So all carbon atoms are like all other carbon atoms. All hydrogen atoms are like all other hydrogen atoms. And he also told us that elements are different because their atoms are different. So that means like a hydrogen atom would be different than a nitrogen atom, which would be different than a lead atom. Now, at some point, we transitioned from this model to get a little closer to what we think atoms are today. Now, in order to switch from this hard sphere model and find some more subatomic particles, we used electromagnetism. So Coulomb's law tells us that opposite charges attract and like charges repel. You can see that in the little picture there. Now, we can essentially use electricity and magnetism pretty interchangeably, and you'll be able to see that in the cathode ray tube experiment. Now, J.J. Sompson created an electrified vacuum tube called the cathode ray tube, and he shot a beam of negatively charged particles, and what he did was he applied a magnet and an electrical charge to this beam to see what would happen. So we can see here that the beam is hitting a fluorescent screen and that hit light tells us that there is a beam. Now, we apply an electrical field to this beam, and you can see that the beam bends towards the positive electrode. So that's showing us that that beam is negatively charged. So now we do the same thing, but this time we apply a magnet. So when we apply the magnetic field, you can see the beam is also forced to bend. So if the positive pole of the magnet attracted the beam and the negative pole of the magnet deflected the beam, that showed us that our beam was negatively charged. J.J. Thompson also put a paddle wheel, think of that like a pinwheel, in the middle of the cathode ray tube. And when he shot that ray from, one, from the cathode to the anode, he noticed that the wheel spun. So that gave us our next discovery that that beam has mass. So Thompson's experiment with the cathode ray tube told us that we have tiny particles that are smaller than the whole atom. We no longer just have this neutral sphere. And this tiny particle has a negative charge. So we call that new subatomic particle the electron, and we use E negative to tell us it's an electron. This new model of the atom, he called the plum pudding model. We can call it the chocolate chip cookie model. You can call it the pepperoni pizza model, whatever way you're going to remember it. So essentially we have this big sphere of positive charge and we have all of these negative electrons throughout. So if you're thinking of a chocolate chip cookie or a chocolate chip muffin, think about the whole muffin is that positive charge and all of the chocolate chips are your negative electrons.
So we still know that the atom overall is neutral, but it does have a positive and a negative part. So the next scientist we're going to talk about is an American physicist, Robert Milliken, and he did the oil drop experiment. Now, this experiment right here allowed us to find the charge on a single electron. So what you're going to see is we have this atomizer right here that shoots oil. Gravity then pulls the oil droplets through this tiny little hole. And this plate, as well as the plate on the bottom, are charged. Now, what he was also doing was shooting charge through here. Now, as you would hit these little oil droplets, they would become charged. So we turn that voltage on and we would mess with the voltage of the plates. And depending on where those droplets fell, we were able to determine the mass to charge ratio. We can figure out by how they're falling what the mass is. You can look at the diameter of the oil droplet and figure out what the mass is. But depending on the charge it takes to move those particles, we can figure out the mass to charge ratio, making the charge of an electron this number that you see right there. Now, we're going to think of an electron as being negative 1. So, we still have this plum pudding model, but now we're getting to the good stuff. We are finding our nucleus. So, using these same particle beams, scientists were able to then find a particle beam with a positive charge. They were shooting positively charged alpha particles, which are really just helium nuclei. And through this experimentation, they were able to discover the proton, and we use the sign P positive for proton. Now, protons have a mass about 2,000 times that of an electron. So electrons are super crazy small, um, but it has exactly equal but opposite charge. So electrons, we say, have a negative one charge. Protons have a positive one charge. But at this point we're still missing some of the mass. So we only know that we have protons and electrons, but we're missing something. So Ernest Rutherford did what we call the gold foil experiment. So he shot alpha particles at a piece of gold foil. Now, originally he thought that all of these beams are gonna pass directly through the foil, but some of these beams shot back in different directions or went in different ways. This video is super awesome. I'm not going to watch it right now because it's six minutes long, but it does a really great job explaining this experiment. So I recommend going to YouTube, finding it, or finding it on the Moodle page. It's great. So we have this radioactive source right here, shooting a beam. And some of the particles deflected backwards, some went sideways, and some went straight through. Now, looking at this right here, we're able to see that if some of these particles bounce, that means they had to have hit a positive particle. And because most of our beams went straight through, we were able to find out quite a few important things. Like... If most of our beams can fit through, that means the atom is mostly empty space. And if my positive particles are bouncing off, there has to be a positive part to my atom. So from this experiment, we discovered the nucleus. We figured the nucle nucleus was super dense and had a positive charge. We figured out that most of the atom's mass is in the nucleus because most of the atom is empty space and the nucleus is super small compared to the rest of the atom so remember we're thinking about how dense this is that's our whole one foot by one foot box and putting 62 billion cars into it that was that whole video we watched about how small an atom is okay that nucleus is super dense and super positive now we're still missing part of our mass here 
30 years later, so way after we now have this nuclear model, James Chadwick studied beams of particles by Irene Curie. And he found that the beams were not deflected by electric or magnetic fields like the cathode ray beam was. And that meant that the beam had to be neutral. So in this sense, he discovered the neutron, which is our neutral particle in the nucleus. And we find that this neutron has the same mass or about the same mass as a proton, but has no charge. So now we've added protons and neutrons are in my nucleus and around my nucleus, I am surrounded by negatively charged electrons. And until the next unit where we talk a little bit more about Bohr, this is where we're stopping with our models of the atom.